We continue our study of the book of Isaiah, a prophet whose name mirrors his message. His name means Jehovah saves, and the message of his book is that Jehovah saves. We spent the first part of our study looking at the first 39 chapters of the book, which emphasized the unfaithfulness of Judah and Jerusalem and the resulting consequences of judgment that were going to come. And not only the judgment of Judah, but the judgment of all the nations who uh, mistreated Judah. God used those nations to punish Judah, but they were not guiltless. And in fact, they chose to do evil, and so they would be judged and accountable to God as well. We saw this illustrated in the life of Hezekiah, the idea of God extending grace. Uh, and we began last week to look at the final section of the book that emphasizes God's deliverance of his people and their future glory. And we started in chapter uh, 40, looking at the, the message of comfort that now is going to be uh, repeated again and again to God's people. Comfort not only concerning the end of the Babylonian captivity, which Isaiah talks about even, you know, a century, over a century before it begins. Uh, God is already revealing before it happens that it's, it, it, it will have an end, that it's not going to be their end. And in fact, God is going to not only deliver them from captivity, but he's going to deliver all men and from the greatest captivity, the captivity of sin. And so uh, he's going to accomplish this through his special servant, the ideal servant, the Messiah. He's going to talk about in these chapters uh, the unfaithful servant of Judah and how oftentimes they were blind and rebellious and how they often forsook and failed God, but God would not forsake them. He'll talk about his servant Cyrus and the special role that he'll have in defeating Babylon and allowing Judah to return. But he talks most importantly about the ideal, the ideal servant, the Messiah, in four servant songs. We looked at one last week in chapter 42. We'll look at others this week beginning in chapter 49. But as we think about the ground that we covered last week and the comfort that God has offered in chapter 40, verses 1 and 5, he says, Comfort my people. Comfort, oh, comfort my people, says your God. He reminds them in verse 5 that God is going to reveal his glory through them. All will see it. Uh, even with our flaws and failures, we can be a demonstration of, of God's glory. In fact, Paul talks about in Ephesians, the third chapter, how God's grace makes manifold his wisdom to, to all the host of heaven. We see in chapter 41, because of God's faithfulness to his people, that they have no reason to fear. God is on their side. He will help them. He will deliver them. This message is repeated in 41 verse 10 and again in verse 13. And again in verse 14, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous hand. And in verse 13, I am the Lord your God who upholds your right hand, who says to you, do not fear. I will, I will help you. And again, repeats the same in verse 15. We see that The special ideal servant is introduced for the first time in chapter 42. God's servant, his chosen one in whom his soul delights, the one on whom uh, he places his spirit, the one who will bring forth justice to the nations, the one who uh, will not extinguish the bruised reed or uh, extinguish the burning wick, will not break the bruised reed, this one who will uh, give breath to the spirit, uh, breath to the people. Uh, this one whom the Lord has called in righteousness in verse 6. This one who will hold you by the hand and watch over you. And I will appoint for you as a covenant, the people, and as a light to the nations. God's ideal servant, the Messiah, is going to be a covenant to the people and a light to the nations. Verse 7, he says, to open blind eyes, uh, 
to bring out prisoners from the dungeon and those who dwell in darkness from the prison. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor praise to graven images. Behold, the former things have come to pass. Now I declare to you new things. God has talked about their past failures. God has talked about judgment, but he's talking about a bright and glorious future in the remaining portions of the book of Isaiah. He has mentioned that he, he loves them and they're precious in his sight in chapter 43, verse 4. And again, that they will show forth his glory in chapter 43 and verse 7. That his plan in chapter 44 and verse 22 is to wipe out their transgressions, uh, to redeem them, for them to return to him. We see in the last verse of chapter 4 and the first the last verse of chapter 44 and the first verse of chapter 45, the special role that Cyrus is going to play in this uh, physical deliverance. But more importantly, uh, after the defeat of Babylon in chapters 46 and 47, we come today to, to chapter 49 and to the second of the servant songs and to the, the great deliverance that is needed by, by every man. In chapter 49, verses 1 through 13, we read, Listen to me, O islands, and pay attention, you peoples, from afar. The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother. He named me. He has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he has concealed me. He has also made me a select arrow. He has hidden me in his quiver. He said to me, You are my servant, Israel, in whom I will show my glory. But he's going to go on to show in verse 5 that it's not actually the nation that he's talking about, but one who comes from the nation. In verse 5, and now says the Lord who formed me from the womb to be a servant, to bring Jacob back to him so that Israel might be gathered to him. And so there's a sense in which salvation comes from uh, the nation. That is, this glorious Messiah is going to come from the nation, but it's this individual, not the nation, that's going to bring the nation back in verse 5, to bring Jacob back so that Israel might be gathered to him. And not only Israel, but in verse 6 he says, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also make you a light to the nations so that my salvation may reach the end of the earth. And so this special servant that God talks about in this passage is one who was called from the womb, whether uh, and whose name was given by his mother, whether referring to Mary or referring to uh, the nation that he comes from. Uh, the point is that his, his speech, his words are going to be effective, his tongue like a uh, mouth like a sharp sword. He's going to be God's servant in verse 3 who is going to show his glory and he's going to bring back God's people in verse 5 but not only the tribes of Jacob he's going to bring salvation to the ends of the earth and so in chapter 49 verse 7 he says thus says the Lord the redeemer of Israel and its holy one to the despised one to the one abhorred by the nation to the servant of rulers kings will see and arise princes also bow down because the Lord, who is faithful to the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. And so even though this servant, who's going to bring salvation to all men, will be despised and abhorred, in God's sight, he's the chosen one. And so in verse 8, thus says the Lord, in a favorable time, I have answered you. And in the day of salvation, I have helped you. And I will keep you and give you for a covenant of the people to restore the land to make them inherit the desolate regions, saying to those who are bound, go forth. To those who are in darkness, show yourselves. Along the roads they will feed, and their pasture will be on all bare heights. They will not hunger or thirst, nor will the scorching heat of sun strike them down. For he who has compassion on them will lead them, and will guide them to springs of water. We see in verse 13, the Lord has comforted his people, and will have compassion on his afflicted and so the message is that this servant uh, this comforting message is that God 
is going to deliver them, that God is, has comfort and compassion for the afflicted, that he's going to send one who's going to bring salvation, one who's going to provide for their needs. They will not hunger and thirst. They will not suffer, but God is going to uh, provide for them and care for them and bring about their release and salvation. Ironically, despite God's attestation of this, Zion's response is, the Lord has forsaken me in verse 14. They believe that God has given them up, that the, the, their fate at the hands of the Assyrians and the Babylonians and others uh, are, are a sign that God has deserted them. But God makes the point in chapter 49 and verse 15 that he would never forget them, never forsake them. He says, can a woman forget her nursing child? and no, have no compassion on the son of her womb, even these may forget, but I will, for not, I will not forget you. Behold, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. We see that God affirms in the last verse of chapter 49 that, uh, that he has not forgotten them. In fact, he says, I will feed your oppressors with their own flesh and they will become drunk with their own blood as with sweet wine. And all flesh will know that I, the Lord, am your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. He goes on to say in chapter 50, in the first few verses, as a bridge before the next servant song, that God has not failed man. God has not deserted man. But rather it is man, the nation of Judah, and all men who have deserted God and failed God. Thus says the Lord in chapter 50, verse 1, where is the certificate of divorce by which, have I, by which I sent your mother away or to whom of my creditors did I sell you? Behold, you were sold for your iniquities and for your transgressions. Your mother was sent away. It wasn't God that sent the people away. It was the people who left him. And the consequence of that would be the separation that they will experience in captivity. But the separation really begins uh, between man and God in the garden. And it's this separation that is going to be overcome by God through his ideal servant, the Messiah. This is, this is the servant that's going to be under discussion in chapter 50, verses 4 through 9 in the third servant song, as the servant who, like God, was re rejected by men. Um, his continual effort has been to, to redeem man, even though man uh, doesn't find him very attractive, very appealing, uh, rejects and refuses him. As John would say in the Gospel of John in chapter 1 and verse 10, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. This ideal servant uh, was not disobedient like the rebellious servant of Judah. In verse 5, the Lord has opened my ear and I was not disobedient, nor did I turn back. I gave my back to those who strike me and my cheeks to those who pluck out the beard. I did not cover my face from humiliation and spitting. For the Lord God helps me, therefore I am not disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint and I know that I will not be ashamed. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up to each other. Who has a case against me? Let him draw near to me. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who is he who condemns me? Behold, they will all wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them. Who is among you that fears the Lord, that obeys His vo obeys the voice of his servant? I'll come back to verses 10 and 11 in a moment. But notice here in verses 4 through 9 that this servant under discussion is not a disobedient servant in verse 5. He's a servant in verse 6 who is submissive. He is a servant who relies on God. We see in both, verse 7 and in verse 9. And he's a servant that's going to be vindicated by God uh, in, in verse, verses 8 and 9. And so the question comes, how will we respond to this servant? Uh, in verse 10, will we imitate him? Will we uh, fear the Lord, obey his voice? Will we walk by faith, not by sight? Even 
in what appears to be darkness when we can't understand or don't know what God is doing, where we have faith and confidence and trust in him, uh, trust in the name of the Lord and rely on God, or will we instead seek to uh, follow our own understanding and create our own light, uh, satisfying uh, our uh, own expectations, kindle our own fire, encircle ourselves with firebrands, walk in the light uh, of our own fire. If, if this is our course, if we choose our will instead of God's will, if we choose our way instead of his way, one that we're comfortable with instead of one that we may not be comfortable with, the result is that at the end of chapter 50, we will lie down in torment. And so uh, as we look at chapter 50, again, the appeal is made uh, to be an obedient servant, a submissive servant like the Messiah. We're told in chapter 51, verses 1, 4, and 7 to listen, to pay attention, to listen. And in fact, uh, he says, uh, Isaiah says, in verse 2, look to Abraham your father and to Sarah who gave birth to you in pain. When he was but one, I called him and then blessed him and multiplied him. Indeed, the Lord will comfort Zion and he will comfort all her waste places. In her wilderness, he will make like Eden in her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her. Thanksgiving and sound of a melody. He says, pay attention to me, my people. Give ear to me, my nation. For a law will go forth from me, and I will set my justice for a light of the peoples. My righteousness is near. My salvation has gone forth. My arms will judge the peoples. In verse seven, 6, he says, My salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will not wane. Listen to me. And so, you know, we think about Abraham and Sarah, and how Abraham was a servant who obeyed God's voice and submitted to God's will and trusted him even when things didn't make sense. Uh, one who had been uh, promised blessings through his seed, even though he had no children. One who in old age didn't have a child. One who when he had a child was told to offer him as a sacrifice to God. Instead of Abraham rationalizing, saying this doesn't make sense to me, I'll do this instead. Abraham listened. Abraham obeyed. Abraham submitted. Abraham trusted. And as a result, uh, God's blessings, even though they were not to come in his lifetime, as the Hebrew writer would note in Hebrews chapter 11, uh, they would come and he could see by faith and believe that God's will would be accomplished and that God's purpose for him was to bless him and not to forsake him. We see Abraham's trust in God, that indeed uh, God is going to bring comfort to his people in Isaiah 51 and verse three, a comfort that doesn't just bring them back to the city of Jerusalem after captivity in Babylon, but a deliverance that brings them back to the state that, they, that man was in in Eden, in perfect fellowship with God, uh, not separated, by his sins. And notice this isn't just for the nation of Judah, but it's for the peoples in verse four, plural. Righteousness and salvation forever. This is God's plan. In verse eight, he says, but my righteousness will be forever and my salvation to all generations. It's interesting, you know, when you look at this, I skipped verse eight, I should go back to that. Uh, it's, it, it's interesting how often Christ uses language like this in the Gospels when he says, uh, for the moth will eat them like a garment and the grub will eat them like wool. Christ again and again reminds his listeners of, of focusing on the things that are eternal, not on the things that are temporary. Don't worry uh, about things that are made of stone or wood or fabric. Uh, Worry instead about your relationship and be concerned with your relationship for God. Trust God. Don't fear those who can kill the body in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28. Uh, don't worry about what pleases man. Don't be afraid or dismayed by how men receive or reject you, but rather 
like the Messiah, do what is pleasing to God, chapter 1, verses, John chapter 8, verses 28 and 29. Never let that which is temporary displace our attention on what is eternal, God's salvation and God's righteousness. Just like God delivered Israel from Egypt in chapter 51, verses 9 and 10, their deliverance is certain, our deliverance is certain. Deliverance from Egypt didn't come from man, but it came from God. And our deliverance will always come from God. It comes because God has compassion on us. And that is our only hope in Isaiah chapter 49 and verse 13. Listen to the description of God's deliverance in Isaiah chapter 51, verses 12 through 13. I, even I, am he who comforts you. Who are you that you are afraid of man who dies and the son of man who is made like grass, that you have forgotten the Lord your maker, who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth, that you fear continually all day long because of the fury of the oppressor as he makes ready to destroy? But there is the fury of the oppressor. But where is the fury of the oppressor? The exile will soon be set free. Why should they be afraid of the king of Assyria or the king of Babylon? Uh, they are nothing compared to the king of kings, our creator, the one who has compassion on us, the one who cares for us. God says to Isaiah that, uh, that the tormentors will become the ones who are tormented in verse 23 he says i will put it into the hand of your tormentors who have said to you lie down that we may walk over you you have even made your back like the ground and like the street for those who walk over it uh, their mistreatment is going to end and those who have caused the mistreatment are going to be judged in chapter 52 we see that god's salvation will not be accomplished, earned, or purchased by man, but rather in verse 3 that this is going to come from God. For thus says the Lord, you were sold for nothing and you will be redeemed without money. Redeemed without money. This won't be man's doing, but it will be God's doing. Just like Egypt. Uh, it wasn't the army of Israel that delivered them from Egypt. Uh, like Assyria. It wasn't the army of Israel that slew the thousands of Assyrian soldiers in the night, but it was the angel of the Lord. Indeed, true deliverance always comes from God, not man. Our peace, happiness, and salvation are the result of God's reign, of his rule. Isaiah says, How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who announces peace, and brings good news of happiness, who announces salvation, and says to Zion, your God reigns. It's the fact that God reigns that allows us to know peace, to know happiness, to know salvation. And so we need to continually be reminded that who God is, as we talked about last week, that he is in control, is always in control. Uh, the one who loves us and cares for us and desires us, uh, he is the one who is in control of all. And he has great plans for us, all to be accomplished in his ideal servant, the Messiah. And this servant is described in probably the best known of all the servant psalms in chapters, uh, chapter beginning in chapter 52 and, and verse 13. We read, Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. Just as many were astonished at you, my people, so his appearance was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Thus he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him. For what had not been told them they will see, and what they had not heard they will understand. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him 
nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief, if he would render himself as a guilt offering. He will see his offering, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, I will justify the many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot to him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured, it out, poured out himself to death, and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many, and interceded for the transgressors. In this best known of the servant psalms, we see that God's servant in chapter 52 and verse 13 will prosper and be exalted. And indeed, this is the message in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost in verses 30, 34 through 35, when Peter proclaims that Jesus, who had been crucified, had been raised from the dead and exalted to the right hand of God. It's the same message that was preached by the Apostle Paul uh, in Ephesians chapter 1. And beginning in verse 20, as he talks about uh, the place that Christ was elevated to because uh, of his obedience and submission to God. Paul says, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And he would go, Paul would go on to write in Philippians, the second chapter of, of Christ and the mind that we should have when he says that Christ in verse six, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant. And being made in likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father." And yet, this one who would prosper and accomplish God's work would not be what people expected. He would be an astonishment. Uh, no one expected uh, their deliverer uh, to be a carpenter's son, uh, as some said in the Gospels. Can any good thing come out of Galilee? No one expected the deliverer to ride into Jerusalem on the foal of an ass. Can you imagine the Lone Ranger on a donkey instead of on silver? The Messiah wasn't at all what men were looking for. And yet this Messiah, this special ideal servant, would sprinkle, cleanse many nations in chapter 52 and verse 15. 
again, the, the astonishing, unexpected nature of this Messiah is uh, portrayed in chapter 53 and verse 1. You know, who can believe the message? Uh, he grew up like a tender shoot, like a root out of parched ground. He had no stately form or majesty. He was despised and forsaken, a man of sorrows. John would say in John chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, that his own creation didn't recognize him, and his own people received him not when he came. His sorrows were not for himself, but for the lost and sick and those who were separated from God the Father. This special servant would bear our griefs in verse 4, would be smitten and afflicted. And when you read the gospel accounts and you read about the mocking and the scourging before the trial and during the trial and, and after the trial, even the, uh, the treatment that Christ received on the cross, as in verse 5, he was pierced and crushed for our healing. It is we who have sinned in verses 6 through 8, but it's he who pays the price, he who receives our punishment, even though Peter notes in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 22 that he was, he was without sin. This sinless one received the penalty for sin uh, instead of our receiving that penalty. In 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 21, Peter writes, For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example that you should follow in his steps, who committed no sin nor was any deceit in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed, for you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Indeed, uh, verse 9 says that, that this servant would die with the wicked. Uh, he was execu executed between two malefactors, the gospel account records. And yet in his death, he would also be associated with the rich, the honorable. And we see in Matthew chapter 27 and verses 57 through 60, that one of his disciples, Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man, came and buried him in a, a tomb that he had purchased for himself, a new tomb that had never been used. And as we marvel at what God describes in this passage, it's, it's just amazing that, that in verses 10 and 11, that the Lord is pleased to allow this, to accept this sacrifice, for his servant to be crushed, to put to grief, to uh, all so that many sons could be brought to glory, so that the separation between man and God could be removed. What God's desire in verse 11 was to justify many, and the only way this could happen was for, for his servant to bear our iniquities. Indeed, it is as Paul writes in Romans chapter 5, verses 18 through 19, although Adam's actions produced many sinners, Christ's actions produced many saints. We could never exhaust the riches of this passage and what we learn of the Messiah and the unfathomable riches of God's love and mercy. We often refer to this passage and think on this passage when we remember the Lord's death and partaking of the Lord's Supper, and fittingly so. We uh, will look next week at uh, chapters 54 through 56. Actually, We've only got two weeks left to cover two lessons, and so I'll probably combine, uh, do chapters 54 through maybe chapter 60 on the 23rd, 
and then 61 through 66 on the 30th. We hope that you're able uh, to read those chapters and be blessed by the words of the prophet and able to join us uh, again uh, for our last two studies uh, that still are to take place as we read of uh, God's great love, God's great mercy, of God's deliverance for his people, and how all of this will demonstrate uh, to all men and to all his creation, both on earth, the seen and the unseen in heaven, the, the unfathomable love, mercy, and grace of our loving Father. Thank you and look forward to being with you uh, again. May God bless you in your study of this book.